a few more examples. Let's start with the geometric power series, f of x equals 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on. So that'll be the same as 1 over 1 minus x in some sense. We'll make that clear in the next section. Now, we could also rewrite this as some sequence element x to the n. Let's look at the derivative. My derivative, okay, well, if we go with this, it's going to be bring down the n and then take one off the exponent. Or I can go term by term on this sum right here. So 1 goes to 0, x goes to 1, 2x, 3x squared, and so on. Now, if you believe that this is going to represent the function 1 over 1 minus x in some sense, then the derivative here, this power series should represent the derivative of this in some sense. So the derivative of this is just going to be 1 over 1 minus x squared. And we'll connect these two in a little bit. All right, let's take a look at the antiderivative. So I'm going to take antiderivative f of x dx. What do we do? I start with my constant of integration, and then I can go term by term. So it'll give me x plus x squared over 2, plus x cubed over 3, plus x to the fourth over 4. Or I could just take a look at our sum here and just do it to the sequence element. So we just add 1, flip it over, gives me x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Let's check our intervals of convergence. For the original function, we've seen this could go from minus 1 to 1. Leave out the endpoints. If you want to recheck those, just note if I put a 1 in here, this is going to be sum from n going from 0 to infinity of 1 against itself. Okay, that's just 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Definitely that's going to diverge. If I put the minus 1 in, that's just going to alternate between a minus 1 and a 1. And we've already seen that that diverges. So no endpoints. How about the derivative? Well, if I look at the derivative here, the open interval will be the same, going from minus 1 to 1. And then we check the endpoints again. We'll notice what's going to happen. If I put a 1 in here, we're looking at sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of n. We could use the limit test for divergence here. The limit as n goes to infinity of n is plus infinity. That's not 0. So that means our series is not a convergent series. If it was convergent, the limit would have to go to 0. If I go with minus 1, same idea. That thing's going to diverge. All right. Let's take a look at the antiderivative. Now, with the antiderivative, something happens. Let's take a look. So our antiderivative is going to be c plus this guy here. Okay, the open interval will be the same. We just have to recheck the endpoints. So if I put a 1 in here, it's going to diverge because we're looking at 1 over n plus 1. Okay, that's related to 1 over n, which diverges because it's a p-series with p equal to 1. Then also note, if I put a minus 1 in here, we get minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And suddenly that converges. That's just going to be an alternating series. And you would just have to show your three items, which aren't too difficult in this case. So we pick up an equality on this side. But it's only a technical equality. Because really, okay, if the domain of our original function is just going to be given by some set when I do the derivative or the antiderivative, we really don't consider expanding the domain out. So it really would depend on what you're asking for with your problem. But as a power series, just defined like this, that's going to be our interval of convergence. OK, next example. We've seen this before. So this is the power series I'm claiming goes with cosine. So 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on. You just alternate, and it's always going to be the even powers. Let's see what happens when I take the derivative. OK, going term by term, we're going to have a 0. The 2 comes down, giving me minus x. The 4 comes down, giving me x cubed over 3 factorial. Because remember, 4 factorial is 1, 2, 3, 4. When that 4 comes down, it turns into 1, 2, 3. And then 6 on the top here is going to come down, canceling out the 6 and the 6 factorial, making it a 5 factorial. So we're going to get this. Now, if I claim that this is going to represent cosine somehow, derivative of cosine is going to be minus sine. 
So claiming that this thing's going to represent minus sign somehow. We'll see that later. All right, let's go in the other direction. I'm going to take any derivative of f of x dx. So I get my constant, and then I'm just going to go term by term. So it's going to be x. Then here, we're going to add one and flip it over. So it's going to give me a x cubed. And then the 3 is going to go with my 2 factorial and become 3 factorial because it's 1 times 2. Now it's 1, 2, 3. Then here, we're going to add 1 and flip it over. That's going to turn x to the fifth. Then the 5 is going to come down. 1, 2, 3, 4. We're putting a 5 on it, so that becomes 5 factorial now. And so on here. So we notice this thing we would expect if that's cosine. Any derivative of cosine is going to be sine. So we're looking at sine plus a constant. All right, intervals of convergence. Well, for the first one we've seen before, that's going to be all reals. So there's no endpoints to check. So it's going to be all reals for all three cases.